You're listening to Next on the Tee with Chris Mascaro, where PGA and LPGA legends, pros, and top instructors come to share their stories, insights, and tips. Now, back to you, Chris. All right, now back with me on the French Lick Resort guest line is a guy who has become very important to me over the years and a big part of our show, and that's 2003 PGA champion Sean McKeel. Sean is by far one of the most underrated players who's ever played out on tour. He, is, he doesn't get enough credit, and then, you know, he's achieved so much more than he is given credit for. Yes, the media recognizes the fact that he won the 2003 PGA Championship, but they fail to give him credit for things like his second-place finish in 2006 back at the PGA, finished runner-up to Tiger Woods at Medina, his second-place finish at the 2006 World Match Play Championship after he defeated Tiger Woods in the first round, or his 20 top 10 finishes and his 57 top 25s. He's only the second player to ever record a double eagle in the U.S. Open, which he did back in 2010 at Pebble Beach. And after getting to know Sean over the last several years, I know he's looking forward to getting out on the Champions Tour in January, and I'm certainly looking forward to rooting for him when he gets out there, and I'm very honored that he is back with me again tonight here on Next on the Tee. Hey, Sean, how are you, my friend? Hi, Chris. How are you? Oh, fantastic. Thank you. So, Sean, I wanted to start our time tonight by going back to your memories of this day 17 years ago. Here we are on September the 11th. So going back to 2001, a day that we're going to carry with us forever. It was a Tuesday, just like it is this year. I know you were coming off a tie for 34th at the Canadian Open that previous Sunday with the Tampa Bay Classic was going to be the next uh, event on the PGA Tour, and that event, like the WGC Championship in Missouri the following week, both canceled. But I uh, wanted to go back to 2000 and, uh, 2001 and get your memories of September 11th. All right. So, I mean, much like uh, me, everybody, it's a, it's a tough day, you know. Um, you know, a lot tougher for others than, than myself. But, you know, just going back, I mean, I think all of us remember uh, pretty much – pretty vividly of, of everything that happened, um, where they were, you know, what time it was, you know, what they were having for breakfast, you know, anyway, I had, um, uh, was coming back on, was supposed to come back Sunday night from the Canadian open. And we had a, I think it was pretty bad weather up there. So I, my flight got delayed till Monday and I was a pretty early flight, got home Monday and, and, um, you know, got home from the airport and just kind of did my normal things. It was time to cut the grass. So I cut the grass and I remember kind of going in and I wasn't feeling particularly well. And, and ultimately ended up in the emergency room that afternoon with a kidney stone. Wow. Um, and I was supposed to, and I, yeah. And I was supposed to fly to Tampa that night. So I, I, I delayed that trip until Tuesday morning and Tuesday morning I was out in the backyard walking my dog and my wife came running out saying there's a plane that hit the world trade center. And, you know, I just kind of immediately thought, oh, they must have bad weather. And somebody just cruising up and down the, you know, one of the rivers out there, just, you know, whatever. And um, went back inside and saw that there's no way that that was a, a small, small airplane. And I sat there riveted to the TV, much like everybody else. Now, um, when all was said and done, you know, two, two months prior to that, I was at Westchester playing. And I was actually doing some business with Cantor Fitzgerald. I'd done some outings for them in their West coast office. Um, at a, um, and so, uh, in June, middle of June that year, I had gone uh, to meet a gentleman by the name of Fred Veraki who worked for Cantor Fitzgerald. And he was actually the president of a company called E speed, which was part of Cantor Fitzgerald. And we had, we had lunch on the 104th floor up there at the windows of the world restaurant. It was, you know, two months, two months and a week prior to the events that happened on September 11th. And, uh, I didn't really think much about that until later. Um, obviously felt for all the people there because I was, I had just been there. Um, but yeah, I mean, I sat there like a lot of people with, um, you know, with a ton of emotions and a lot of anger that I still, I think that all of us still kind of harbor, um, uh, to a certain degree. I can't even imagine what the families, uh, that lost friends and loved ones really must be feeling. But anyway, that was my experience and it was, uh, you know, I try to explain that to my children. My children are both 14 and 11, so they 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 only know so much from what I've been able to tell them and what they've read and and seen on TV. But it was a obviously a horrific day uh, in this country. Yeah, it certainly was, and I, I appreciate you sharing that story, Sean. 
I know you and your dad, you know, both <clears throat> pilots. So I, I, I'm, I'm assuming that, you know, boy, you must have had a, a deeper connection with what was going on. You talk about being riveted to the TV. As a, as a pilot, you know, I, what was it like as a pilot looking at what happened and then obviously the, the remaining events, events of the day, uh, knowing what must have been going on in those airplanes? <laughs> Well, certainly my experience as a pilot was was nothing compared to what the the men and women do each and every day um in those big jets. Um my father however was 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 on an air was on a flight from Sydney I think up to Penang and uh so he was in Asia and he got something through his through the electronic um it's called the ACARS and it, it it's a way to receive messages from the company. And there was a little bit told to him about that, but they said that, you know, you as soon as you got to uh, uh, Penang to please call in and, and all that stuff, and that's when he found out. But he was in the air uh, when he got word of that, too. But it's, you know, it's a bit disturbing. I mean, you know, there were obviously a lot of things that kind of um, – he really had to fall in line uh, for those acts to have been committed. I mean, I, I, you know, you think about – we've all heard the videos or the audios of the phone calls that were made um, by some of the flight attendants from some of the family members. And certainly I've heard some of the audio tapes um, that probably aren't out there in the public from air traffic control. And they're pretty, pretty sickening actually. Um, but, um, you know, just as an aviator myself, I just, um, you know, it was just really unbelievable that something like that, the coordination that it took, the planning that it took. And I, I will say, I will say one other thing. My sister was on a flight back to Oregon in um, May or June of that year. And she was sitting next to a person um, just talking to him before the plane landed. And they asked if my sister, if she believed in it, believed in any type of God. And my sister kind of thought that was a strange, uh, strange question from someone she hadn't even had a conversation with the entire flight. And um, that person said, well, you'll all meet, meet your God very soon. And, um, you know, my, she didn't really think much about it. And, and uh, you know, whether that person was someone that was, you know, plotting these flights, was, was testing out the security, I, she doesn't know. But she got a really, really sickening feeling after September 11th because she, it took her back to those, those, that particular day of her flight. So, um, you know, just... Just really, all in all, it's just a sad day. I mean, it's uh, it's just horrific. Yeah, indeed, and that's an unbelievable story. Thanks for sharing that, uh, Sean. Yeah. That's something you know for for your sister have, to have to go through and now remember back on. Amazing stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so changing gears a little bit, Sean. Um, I want to look a few months ahead. As we get to January, you'll reach your fiftieth birthday. I'm, I'm imagining you're doing something that most people our age don't do, which is sort of count down the days until you get to turn 50 so you can go out <laughs> yeah. on the Champions Tour. So, you know, flash forward ahead. How excited, how much are you looking forward to getting out there in January? I am excited, and I, I've been looking you know, forward to this for, for a long time. Um, <clears throat> you know, in my case, um, you know, playing against the younger kids out there on the web.com, you know, it's proven, it really proved to be a challenge. Um, you know, there were a lot of things kind of in play. Uh, you know, losing my father at the very end of 2016 um, really, really was a shock. And it just, I just had a poor attitude through 2017. Uh, certainly, there were a lot of things that I needed to take care of um, on his behalf. And uh, as executive of the estate, that took away a lot of my kind of desire to really want to get out there and compete. I just didn't have the desire to be out there playing and, and you know that finally went away but again you know a lot of these young kids were out and they were they're, they're eager and they're ambitious and they're very very talented um players and they they're all trying to get to the pga tour and i i'm certainly seeing the writing on the wall for me is my career on the pga tour as far as being an exempt player and in, in playing any you know, any consistency out there uh, was coming to an end. And I, and I knew that, um, and I, I could see that coming for a while. So I am excited. I'm excited for a lot of reasons. One, um, you know, I think it just, it, it, uh, will allow me to kind of get back out there and, and play golf with my contemporaries. I mean, 
every single tournament that's played out there, I would be willing to guess that of the 78 guys playing every week, there's probably 75 or 76 of those guys that I've played with at least once in my career. So I look forward to kind of getting back out there and playing with, with, with those guys and certainly playing with guys my own age. Um, there was a, there was a tournament this year and I think it was in, I think it was in Mexico and, um, a couple of the guys out there, both, both kids. I mean, typically, typically I'm the oldest player in the field, which is, which is kind of, it's kind of sad in a way. Um, you know, and I can't help but notice that the guys kind of look at me like, what is this guy still doing out here? So, um, but anyway, so we're playing and, 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 uh, one of the other players and the other caddy were talking about video games and they were talking about Fortnite of all things. I don't know if you're familiar with Fortnite, but I sure am with my, 14 year old son playing. And I, and I just kind of chuckled to myself and I thought, wow, I'm, I'm really out of place here. They're, they're talking about video games and here I'm talking about joining the ARP here very soon. <laughs> so, uh, it was, uh, it, it just something that I just kind of internally just kind of smiled and, and shook my head. And, and I actually, I, uh, I, I told that story to Aaron Rodgers back in, in Greenville, um, in May. We were playing the Pro-Am event, the BMW tournament there in Greenville. And I was paired between Aaron Rodgers um, and the two guys that played on the U.S. Curling team that won the, the curling team that won the gold medal. So every par five, it's, it's, it's playing slow. And um, I get to one hole and I come up to Aaron Rodgers and we're talking. And he kind of, we knew each other a little bit. We started talking about things as our, as our conversation switched to, me playing with the younger kids, I, I mentioned that story to him. And he said, well, funny enough, last year there were two rookies on the Green Bay Packers on the offensive line that he wanted to take to dinner. And he, and then the, and the two guys said, no, we're just going to get some pizza and go back and play Fortnite. And so Aaron, now he's a young guy anyway, but he, he kind of said the same thing. So we, we both had a good laugh about that, but, but that's just, uh, you know, circling back. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to the opportunity um, you know, and as I've said on this show, I've, I've kind of got lost in a lot of, um, well, certainly a lot of self pity, I suppose, for <clears throat> just the way my, I think the way that my end of my PJ tour career has really kind of gone. Um, some of it is self-induced admittedly. Um, some of it is just, you know, bad luck with the shoulder and my heart issue and stuff like that. Um, you know, losing both my parents, it really took a lot out of me and, to be able to compete at a high level, you really have to be all in. And, uh, and I wasn't, and I think, and I, and I blame myself for that. So I don't blame, um, you know, some of the things that have happened to me. I think, you you know, you've got to kind of pick up the pieces and you got to move on. And if you don't, you know, you get, you get lost in the shuffle kind of like I have, but, but I do look forward to playing, uh, you know, starting in February. So Sean, you played in the Barbasol classic back in July, shot a second <clears throat> round 69 and, Barely missed the cut at the PGA Championship last month. So to that end, what's the state of your game? How 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 are you how are you approaching the fall to get geared up for January or February? Well, I've certainly been playing a lot. You know, going back to Kentucky. I mean, I I played um, probably about as well as I could have played. I just didn't I didn't make any putts. It was really kind of sad. And I think that's one of the things that I've noticed with my game is I'm not making the birdies that I used to make, um, you know, whether that's nerves or whether that's just vision and not seeing the greens or lack of confidence or all three, who knows, but, um, it was a bit disappointing there to, to finish. I mean, I made the cut, but that, I should have played a lot better than that. And then the PGA, it's a t- it was a tough course for me. It was long. Um, you know, but, but, uh, you know, my game is actually okay. Um, but, but again, I think I've just kind of caught myself looking forward, uh, to age 50. And I think that's been some of the problem in that I've looked too far ahead. It kind of like these football teams looking ahead to their next opponent rather than playing the one they've got that particular day. And I've fallen prey to that for sure. But, um, you know, the state of my game's okay. Um, you know, just, uh, I'm trying some new equipment, uh, maybe trying some, trying some new shafts. Uh, looking at some some golf balls and things like that, so I'm kind of in testing mode, and I'll probably do that for the next month or so. And then come October, middle of October, I'll probably head down to Florida and and start practicing for a couple of months, getting ready. So, to you know, as you just mentioned, you know, looking at different shafts and balls and stuff like that, are you a uh, 
Are you an equipment uh, free agent right now, or what do you got going on in your bag? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I got a couple of things, uh, just a couple of new things. I and mean, Callaway's been great to me, and um, so I don't know what their plans are for adding any players next year. I mean, there's no significant money really out there on the Champions Tour, for, so it really allows a player like me to, you know, to really put something in the bag that maybe I I, I want to keep or I want to try something new. I mean, I just haven't decided that yet. Um, you know, I'm a loyal guy, so I'm I'm uh, always keen on staying with the same equipment that I've that I've used um, for the last couple of years. But but I don't know if I'm going to do that for sure. So um, I'm just trying out a couple of different things, and and uh, you know, we'll kind of see where that takes you over the next month, month and a half, and then by the you know, like I said, by the middle of October, early November, I'll I'll probably be decided on what I'm going to do. Do you have the uh, rogue driver in your bag? Are you are you uh, are you hitting that off the tee? No, no. I'm still I'm still using the epic driver. Um, you know, I have a couple of rogues. Um, um, and it's, it's a great great piece of equipment. But I just have been very happy with my epic and uh, really haven't found any reason to change. So, Sean, a couple of more before we let you go, and you know, going back to this year's PGA Championship. What were your impressions of Bell Reeve? You said it was a you know it was a long course for you. What'd you think of it overall? Well, I mean, I thought it was a great design. Um, you know, they were hampered by you know the hot weather that we've had here in the South for you know the majority of the summer. Um, I actually got there a couple of days early and played on Saturday night. And to be honest, I was pretty pretty surprised, uh, even though it was a Saturday that. You know, and typically the greens aren't at tournament speed by on Saturday, but they were nowhere near where I thought they needed to be, um, even for a Saturday. But look, they did a great job. The course was in phenomenal shape, and um, you know, I think that that course will stay in the rotation when they when they move it back to May next year. I think it'll be beautiful. Um, it, it was long, a lot of movement. Uh, you know, number ten was five oh eight, fifteen was. Or 14 is 495, or I guess that's 15. Uh, number four was 520 yards, all par fours. So, um, you know, and obviously there were, the fairways were wider, but 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 it uh, it just was such a long course. You weren't getting a whole lot of roll, so everything was about carry there. Um, but my impressions were very positive. I thought they uh, it's a great layout. Um, I didn't know what to expect when I went there. I thought it was a kind of a smaller type venue. Um, until I got out there and just see how spread out it really was. But they did a phenomenal job. The PGA of America always does such a great job. And, um, you know, they always got a, always get a great champion, and they did this year in Brooks. And, uh, wow, I mean, what a weekend it was. I mean, the fans were spectacular. Um, I had my family there, and my daughter and my son were hanging around, and every time I'd, you know, get to the next tee, they were telling me why I, needed, why, why I wasn't hitting it straighter. You know, I visited the rough a few too many times, and they let me know it. But it was fun. It was fun. And I had a good pairing with uh, Y.E. And, and Jason Duffner. And, you know, we all missed the cut. But, but um, you know, for me, it really wasn't about that. It was just, uh, you know, sharing that, that, that time with my family. And, and uh, of course, I was grinding to play well. But it just it just proved to be too much of a challenge to play from the rough. How do you feel about next year's tournament being moved back from August to May? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of there's a lot of there's a lot of question marks, isn't there? I mean, you know, next year we're going to Beth Page. Um, not sure what it's like in May in New York. I'm sure to be I'm sure to be just fine. I mean, I uh, I mean, look, I'm envisioning uh, not snow covered fairways, but definitely um, kind of a wetter, wet, more wet conditions. Uh, certainly a long golf course. Um, so it's hard to say. You know, Rochester comes back into play in uh, – well, actually, it comes into play next year for me in May because that's I mean, my first senior PGO being Rochester the very next week. But you look at, Ro- at Rochester back in May um, again in 2023, it's hard to say. I mean, it's uh, easy to sit here and uh, quarterback it without, without playing one in May. Um, it may turn out just fine. I worry about places like Whistling Straits and and uh, and a few other places, but um, I think they did the best. They made the best decision for them, um, and they're just going to kind of let it play out. And um, look, everybody's going to show up. They may be they may just be wearing sweaters. <laughs> right, Sean. Before 
<laughs> Indeed. So, Shaw, before we let you go, remind our listeners about the work you do for the local Make-A-Wish Foundation there in Memphis. Well, Stephanie and I ha- actually, um, we, we started the tournament in uh, 2004. It was our first year with Make-A-Wish. I've been a big supporter of theirs and, and really all the Make-A-Wish communities uh, around the country. Um, and um, actually, Stephanie and I turned that event over over to them uh, this year. I, I just kind of found myself had so much going on. Um, so I don't have my name on the tournament anymore, but, but, uh, I'm still involved with them and still communicate with them and try to help the kids, um, as best as I can. And, um, you know, I've always been a huge supporter of of St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Um, you know, as almost a lifelong Memphian. That's, uh, just kind of part of my fiber now, I guess, uh, trying to help the kids. So, uh, you know, our 14 years were incredible. I learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot about my kids, and I certainly learned a lot about the children of St. Of St. Jude, Make-A-Wish, and the families and, that are affected with these diseases. So, um, you know, it just keep on making money and earning money, trying to make those kids smile, and uh, that's what it's all about. Yes, it is. Well, Sean, I can't thank you enough for taking time out of your night to come back and be a part of the show. Let our listeners know, how can they stay up to date with all the great things you're doing, whether it's online or it's on social media? Yeah, well, I haven't posted much, but I'm. Uh, you can find me at Sean McKeel PGA, and uh, I'm on Facebook too. Although I don't post a whole lot, I've kind of gotten a little, little off social media for a while. But um, anyway, that's where you can find me. So, um, always willing to answer any question that you have. Sean, again, thank you so much for being a part of the show. I've missed spending time with you. I'm so glad that we had an opportunity to catch up a little bit tonight. I hope you'll come back and uh, be a part of the show as we head into the fall and as we uh, get uh, prepared to watch you out on the uh, champion store. I can't wait for that to happen. Yeah, Chris, thanks. I appreciate everything you do too. Sean, take care. All the best to you and your family. We'll catch up soon. Sounds good. Take care. See you, Sean. That's 2003 PGA champion, Sean McKeel, and uh, just one of the most wonderful people you'll meet on this planet. So has always done a, a lot for the Make-A-Wish Foundation. And then, as I, as I say, folks, at the top, one of the most underappreciated players, maybe in the history of golf, and we could certainly talk about that with my next guest, Peter Kessler, when he joins me here in a moment. But uh, a guy that, uh, you know, very nearly was a two-time major champion. Again, finished second to Tiger at the 2006 PGA and and uh, finished second at the 2006 World Match Play Championship after defeating Tiger in the first round. So Sean has done a lot of great things. Very much looking forward to rooting for him when he is out on the Champions Tour come next January or February. 